clients often come saying, well, there's a no contest clause. So that means they can't even file the contest, which isn't accurate. Anyone can begin any kind of litigation. It really depends. But the no contest clause is going to inform how you respond to the contest as opposed to whether or not it can actually be filed. Welcome to Absolute Trust Talk with your host, Kirsten Howe. Absolute Trust Talk brings you tips, tools, advice, and interviews to help you build a reliable knowledge base on estate planning, business, and finance to start preparing for your future today. Hello and welcome to Absolute Trust Talk. I am the host today, Kirsten Howe. And we are here today to talk about some of the many ways that families end up in litigation after a death with one of our favorite trust litigators, Jennifer Herlihy. And I think it's important for our planning clients that we check in from time to time with one of our litigation counterparts. And I can't believe that this is the first time we've had Jennifer on the show. It's always good to discuss some of the interesting and creative things that the litigators see people do to try to steal money through estate planning and also to get recommendations for preventing such things in our own clients' families. My guest, as I said, Jennifer Herlihy is a founding partner of Kohler Herlihy LLP. Jennifer represents individuals and professional fiduciaries in trust, estate, conservatorship litigation, including financial elder abuse actions, removal, surcharge actions, contested conservatorships, will and trust contests, accounting disputes, and related civil claims. In essence, you know, if it's any kind of dispute that could happen in probate court, she handles it. Jennifer has significant experience in all stages of disputes, including counseling clients prior to litigation, which she's very effective at. We've used her for that a couple of times, representing clients at mediation and through trial. Jennifer has tried matters in multiple Bay Area courts, including a two-week jury trial in San Francisco County, resulting in a six-figure verdict for her client, a two-week bench trial in Santa Clara County involving an oral contract claim against an estate, resulting in a complete defense verdict and an award of costs, which that's a big deal, and a 10-day bench trial in Contra Costa County relating to issues of incapacity and undue influence, which culminated in a dismissal of all claims against her client. Jennifer graduated from the University of San Francisco School of Law and got her Bachelor of Arts from the University of California, Berkeley. Prior to partnering with Ruth Kohler to form Kohler Herlihy LLP, Jennifer was a partner at Morrell Law and Prior to that, practiced general civil litigation and assisted more than 40 families in that PG&E San Bruno fire case. So she's just got so much litigation experience, a wide variety of litigation experience. Jennifer has been selected to the Super Lawyers Rising Star list by her peers for the last 10 consecutive years. And she has presented to professional groups, including East Bay Trust and Estates Lawyers and Legal Assistance for Seniors on topics related to estate and trust litigation, financial elder abuse, conservatorships, all the things that she does so well. She serves on the board of the Tri-Valley Estate Planning Council, and she's also on the Contra Costa County Court-Appointed Attorney Panel representing conservatees in conservatorship proceedings. The conservatees are entitled to their own attorney, and she does that for them. Jennifer, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having the most (laughs) impressive introduction I've read for a while. I appreciate that. It's good to have you here finally. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for that kind introduction. (laughs) You are most welcome and most deserving. So I want to start by talking about no contest clauses, which we'll explain in a minute what exactly I mean. But that is something that we as planners get asked about a lot. And so Just to make sure listeners are following, a no contest clause is a provision in a trust or a will that says, essentially, if anyone contests this trust or will, they get nothing or they get a dollar or something like that. It's some kind of clause that sets up a punishment for contesting. And I think you can, you know, just logically see the problem with a provision like that. If you leave someone nothing or almost nothing, like a dollar, the threat of forfeiture of that nothing or dollar isn't much of a threat. But what kinds of 
threatened forfeitures have you seen that actually work as a deterrent? That's a really good question. I think we also get asked about them a lot, no contest clauses. Clients often come saying, well, there's a no contest clause. So that means they can't even file the contest, which isn't accurate. Anyone can begin any kind of litigation. It really depends. But the no contest clause is going to inform how you respond to the contest as opposed to whether or not it can actually be filed. But what kinds of contests actually work or what kinds of provisions and trusts actually work to ensure that somebody doesn't file a contest? You have to make the gift to the person significant to them. And that's going to depend on a lot of things. It's going to depend on the size of the estate and the means that the individual whom you're trying to uh, coerce (laughs) into not filing a contest actually has. So typically, as you indicated, leaving a small gift to someone with $10,000 is not going to work. That might work if your estate's only $100,000. But if you're talking a multi-million dollar estate, $10,000 isn't going to dissuade someone from filing a lawsuit typically. Well, yeah, and it's very unlikely. Well, I guess it again, it depends on the size of the estate. It's unlikely it's going to work if you're disinheriting someone. You say you get nothing. And if you contest, you also get nothing. <laughs> That's that. Which, you know, leaving $10,000 in a multi million dollar estate is almost the same thing as saying you get nothing. And if you contest, you get nothing. Okay, I hadn't really thought about the fact that you have to make it also somehow related to the situation of the person. It's not just the size of the estate, but also what is that person's financial situation like? Yeah, I mean, as you know, clients sometimes decide they want to disinherit a kid of theirs or leave a kid of theirs less money if that child has significant means to begin with. That's one of the common reasons that people will cite to wanting to leave that child less. So I think in cases I've seen go to trial, there have been people who have significant means who were left what many people would consider a large sum of money still pushing forward with the contest because to them, 300,000 or 500,000 isn't a big sum. So you know, we can't prevent everything, but it is something I think for estate planners to talk to their clients about, is this going to be significant enough to dissuade a contest from this individual based upon your knowledge of their means? Right. Okay. And I guess it's also true that we don't necessarily know what works to dissuade litigation because if it worked, it's never going to land on your desk. Right, exactly. I mean, that is kind of the quandary that I'm in, because all the cases that I see are obviously ones that are being litigated. So at that point, there's been some kind of breakdown in the no contest clause, because somebody's contesting or somebody has already contested what they're seeing. Right, right. right. Okay. So in all of this discussion about no contest clause, I think it's important to have a clear understanding of just what a no contest clause can and can't do under California law. I mean, we've just been talking about the basic understanding that generally the lay public has about what a no contest clause does and says. There are actions that probably a lay person might think clearly are a contest, but are in fact fall under an exception for some policy reason. And they don't get the no contest provision doesn't get invoked against those kinds of claims. What can you share with us about that? For example, so the contest has to be a direct contest. And there's certain kinds of things that are considered direct contests. So claims regarding a person's capacity or that they were influenced when they signed a document or there was fraud in the inducement of signing a document. Those are all direct contests. But something like claiming the trustee did not account for the assets properly. That is not a direct contest. So if you're challenging the administration of the trust after a decedent has died, those are typically not going to constitute direct contests. And the other portion of the law is that the contest, if it is brought with probable cause, and even if it is a contest involving undue influence or lack of capacity, so even if it's a direct contest, if there was probable cause to bring that contest, the no contest clause is not going to be invoked against that person. And probable cause is one of those loosey-goosey terms <laughs> that um, right. there's not a ton of case law around. 
one of the reasons for that is that most cases settle. So you don't end up with a significant amount of case law involving no contest clauses. Right. Okay. So most of the time you can either convince a judge that there was probable cause or the parties work it out so that there's no published opinion that ever results. Right. There's very few published opinions. There is a case from San Francisco that is not a published opinion, but it does involve the invocation of a no contest clause. I believe it was a, eh, I couldn't quote you on the year. (laughs) Somewhat recently, there was a case in San Francisco that you know, discuss the invocation of a no contest clause against a contestant who the court felt did bring a contest without probable cause. It was very clear in that situation that the decedent did not have a good relationship with that child, but had still left him a a considerable amount of money. I believe it was more than a million dollars. And when he proceeded with the litigation, he was disinherited from that by the superior court. Oh, and there's no appellate court case or the appellate court upheld that? I don't believe they appealed it. Okay. If they did, it's not a published opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Okay. A million (laughs) dollars. Yeah. I mean, people can lose out on large sums of money. And I think clients find no contest clauses to be very interesting. There are other ways to kind of approach the same situation. There's other code sections under the probate code that allow for cost shifting and fee shifting, which can almost result in someone being disinherited. Oh, so talk a little bit more about that. So if an individual takes a case to trial, and for example, they don't have the best advice with respect to their discovery responses, and they deny things that they should have admitted in their request for admissions then they could be the attorney's fees from that period by the other side could have to be paid for by the contestant, which, as you know, these cases are expensive to litigate. So you can get to a point where those attorney's fees end up wiping out anything that the the contestant would have received. Right, right, right. Oh, that's that's interesting. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. There's essentially multiple ways to, you know, proceed. To kind of, uh, yeah, claw that money back. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I never knew that. And I, that's why I rely on you <laughs> <laughs> to handle the litigation. I don't know it. I don't want to know it. Okay. So this might be a dumb question because I always think I know the answer, but I don't trust myself that I do. How far out on the family tree do we need to be worried about contests and no contest clauses? You know, like when I have clients who have no children, do they have to worry about nieces and nephews invoking, you know, challenging their trust, leaving everything to a charity? I think sometimes it depends on the circumstances. But what I try to think about is what would this case look like either in a prior iteration of the document or under intestate succession if they didn't have any prior documents? So, you know, if their prior document left everything to niece number one, she's probably going to be pretty shocked when she gets the new trust leaving everything to the SPCA. Right. So I try to think about it in terms of what did the prior document say? And then if you're making substantial changes, you know, maybe the estate planner is taking really good notes about why the the changes were made. And then there's some kind of language about a no contest clause uh, in in the second iteration. Yeah, we always have to be very cautious when we're making changes, um, especially to our clients of a certain age, right? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, I think for whatever reason, folks get to start, they rely upon an inheritance that they may or may not receive. But if Uncle Fred at some point told his nieces and nephews he was going to leave them everything, and then maybe he never drafted a document that said that, but that's what they think. It's in his best interest and then the best interest of upholding the plan for him to include some kind of no contest clause and also potentially explain to them that he's changed his mind. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So which kind of leads us to what, aside from leaving a sufficiently large inheritance to the person that you're worried about, maybe even someone you'd really prefer to disinherit, what else would you suggest our clients can do to make it just a little harder for the challenging heir <laughs> to, I, to cause trouble? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it really depends on the comfort level of the client with the people who they're trying to disinherit. As I know you've talked about on other podcasts, you would never want people to feel like they have to go get permission from their heirs to change 
their documents. But the best thing to do is not shock someone. Most of the contests that I see are based upon somebody being shocked at the provisions of this instrument, the trust or the will. They're expecting to receive something that they, they didn't. So in order to word that off, my recommendation is to have an actual in-person sit-down, feel-good conversation with somebody if you can, and then follow that up with an email or a text some writing. message, yeah. some kind of writing, maybe a letter. Handwritten letters are always good as well, as long as people can read your handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> that explain, you know, as we talked about last Thursday, I've decided to change my trust. I you know how much I care about dogs and cats, and I've decided to leave everything to the SPCA. Unfortunately, we haven't been as close as we used to be. Uh, this is very <laughs> cursory, but like something that, like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, putting it in writing so that that can be preserved by the trustee or you know the client's attorney. Either way, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen that done where it's forwarded to the attorney to hold as part of their file or it's given to the successor trustee. Yeah. Putting things in writing is always good advice <laughs> Yes, <laughs> from a standpoint. Anyway, uh, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. Exactly. I mean, because people will deny that those conversations sure. occurred if you just have the conversation. But at the same time, I could see that it would be awkward to write a letter, you know, to someone who about something like that, that kind of came out of the blue without having the conversation. So yeah, fair enough. Okay. So that is very good advice. All right. So what I really want to talk to you about, I mean, this has all been fun and interesting, but you know, I want to talk about altered documents and tell us what you've been seeing in this category. Yeah, this is really interesting. In the earlier part of my career, you would see actual forgeries where someone, you know, took mom's signature, put a piece of paper over it and traced it. And you'd use handwriting experts to determine whether that was a forgery. And handwriting experts are still very useful. And I think they're seeing their own practices evolve into a more electronic forgery situation. And I don't even mean, you know, somebody, a DocuSign forgery. I actually think those are a lot harder to do. I mean, people are cutting and pasting a signature from one PDF to another in order to forge a document, essentially. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Now everyone has the technology on their home computer to do stuff. Yeah. Like that. And I don't mean to give anyone a blueprint on how no. to do it, but <laughs> it is fairly easy. And I mean, I think one of the mistakes I've seen estate planners make is they will email a Word document to the client or email a PDF to the client without instruction of this needs to be printed out the whole document and needs to be signed in front of a notary. And then I want you to return, you know, the originals to me or a copy to me. A recent case I've had where somebody essentially seems to have printed the signature page and had the signature page signed, and then they appended it to the PDF. So it's difficult. You can see that the signature page looks different than the rest of the PDF. And it just makes for inconsistencies that leads to a lot of questioning. Yeah. So that might have been done, you know, intentionally and in a good faith way. This is the way the estate planning attorney handled it, but that makes it look a little shady. Yeah, it is. And, you know, there's best practices for estate planners that, I mean, I've always seen <laughs> you follow, but most people don't want to Unless you know a client very well and you've recently seen them, you typically aren't going to email them an amendment without having them come into your office right. and make sure that no one's influencing them or that you want to make sure they're the actual person requesting the changes and, and that they're the one signing the document. But I have seen that happen several times recently where estate planners have emailed documents to people leaving the execution to them. Mm -hmm. which one such case was a copy and paste of a signature into a PDF. And one was the one where I was describing that appears more innocuous, but still has led to some questioning it's, of the yeah, situation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, I hadn't really thought about that, even something that's done correctly, but maybe not in the best practice. Somebody could look at it in a, a little squinty eyed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think if everyone gets along and, most of my cases, everyone yeah. doesn't get along. That's why they're with me. But 95% of the time, it would probably be fine for someone to do that, to print out the last page, execute it, append it to the original PDF. 
but you want there to be consistency through the documents. You don't want to leave a hanging, you know, signature line. Our judges won't sign orders like that. So we, right. we shouldn't have our clients do things like that. You want right. a consistent document where you can tell that the person has signed the actual document that is paginated before the signature. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. You just kind of described some ways that we can make sure that our documents, as the attorneys, we can make sure our documents don't get fussed around with after they leave our offices. Any other advice you have for how clients or attorneys can avoid these kind of electronic alterations? I think there are ways to ensure that your PDF is not altered right, where the person cannot append pages to the PDF that you send them, move them around, etc. That prevents against some electronic sort of disturbances of the document. But best practice, I think, is as we discussed, having an individual come into the office and have the documents executed in front of the attorney, because you can then ensure that all the page lines are lining up and that the signatures of the right document And the right person signing the document. Yeah, yeah. which is not to say that some nefarious person can't do that and say, oh, you know, we just did this. Mom and I did this without mom's attorney. And then you're, you know, we can only do so much on our end. Yes, exactly. And that that happens too. Do stuff, yeah. That happens too, where someone takes a second amendment drafted, you know, maybe you send a second amendment to somebody by email and the daughter takes that and, make some alterations, prints it and has mom sign it. There's only so much you can do, but I think having the client sign the document in front of you is probably the best to practice. Yeah. Because then somebody like you have, you have that argument. Well, all of these other amendments were signed in the attorney's office. Now what's happening here? Why did this happen? So yeah. Okay. Any advice about how we can, I don't know, anticipate deal with, prevent undue influence happening with our estate planning clients? You know, I think so. I think there are sort of best practices that a lot of estate planners employ. I don't know that there is this extended duty for planners to do these kinds of things. So I'm always kind of leery to say you should do it this way. But make sure that you're not just emailing with the child or one of the successor trustee or one of the main beneficiaries. Obviously, sometimes uh, planning clients are sick or elderly, or there's a a pending need that they need this. And you may end up communicating largely with, you know, a trustee or a beneficiary, but make sure that you have notes of your telephonic and in-person communication with the client. The client Um, alone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The client alone. And so I think the only real way for that to stand up is if they're in your office and they didn't get driven there by the trustee, the successor trustee and 80% beneficiary individual, because there's going to be critique of that. Mm -hmm. And that there's case law that says just driving somebody to an attorney's office doesn't constitute undue influence, but try to eliminate as many of the potential factors that go towards undue influence as, as you can. Yeah, because in the end, it's someone like you stitching together a story. And the more not great facts you have, or the more not great facts you have to slam down, you know, so yeah, we've got to do what we can to eliminate all those not great facts. Right. And the notes that the attorney takes are really helpful and important to us in litigation. So I think maintaining those to the best degree possible is super helpful. I know that estate planners don't like to have their files subpoenaed, but the documents, the notes are really the most important thing. Like we already have the documents, you know, we need to know what your impressions of this individual were and try to confirm that, you know, they sat in the meeting alone and told you what they wanted with their estate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let's look at see what audience questions we have. Okay. If an unhappy beneficiary contests unsuccessfully, can the trust's attorney's fees come out of their share, their inheritance? Yes. So twofold, if there is the no contest clause, then that individual would be eliminated from the mm-hmm. document completely. So in that sense, there wouldn't be any inheritance for the fees to come out of. But if you also had an award of attorney's fees and costs, it's possible to have a judgment entered against somebody who brings a contest 
so that they not only are they disinherited, but they owe the trust money. Okay. So they get nothing and they have to pay <laughs> The money. attorney's fees are harder to come by. The cost, if you prevail at trial, you typically will get costs. It is discretionary in probate court, but it does seem that most of the time you get costs. Okay. And costs would be things like all of the deposition costs and any expert witnesses and so could, yeah, in some cases, add up. expert witnesses, your attorneys have to be pretty mindful of making sure that they include the expert witness costs in a way that works, but they can be very substantial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and this is a good question. I like this one. Do attorneys take trust contest cases on a contingency basis? Yes, they do. I personally <laughs> think that it has to be a very solid contest for anybody to want to take it on a contingency, you know, just for your listeners, in case folks don't know what a contingency is, that's a situation where the attorney is taking a percentage of the recovery. So I think maybe it's a good sign for you if somebody's willing to take your case on a contingency, it typically means that they believe in your case, and that they think it's a, a very strong one, because they're essentially waging their own money on the situation, right. they're spending time on the case. So they do. Lawyers definitely take cases on a contingency for beneficiaries, for trustees sometimes, but that has to be approved by the court. Oh, okay. That, I mean, that makes sense because the trustee has a duty to all the beneficiaries. They can't just right. go and sign just... up to pay a lawyer a third of right. the right. estate. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. I have always wondered about that and how common that is. And do you on the other side know about that? Like, is it clear to you that somebody's being represented on a contingency basis? Usually you aren't told by opposing counsel what their situation is, but sometimes it becomes apparent based upon their handling of the case. You know, they're trying to get to a very quick settlement. Mm -hmm. They don't want to engage in significant discovery. They're really trying to get the quickest settlement possible, which, you know, there's two sides to that coin, right? Perhaps it would make more sense to do more discovery so right. that you could figure out if your client is actually like entitled to a larger yes, uh, <laughs> settlement. Yeah. But you know, it really depends on the attorney. But that is one kind of telltale giveaway is when folks are trying to mm -hmm. rush into an early settlement. To be fair, sometimes early settlement makes a lot of sense. So that isn't yeah. the only thing. But a lot of times you can glean from the behavior of opposing counsel and how they're handling the case of what their fee arrangement is. Okay. All right. All right. I think that's it for audience questions. Jennifer, Thank you so much for being here. It's been very informative for me and helpful <laughs> to me and my practice is going to help me help my clients. So thank you. Thank you for having me and for the thoughtful questions. And it's always nice chatting with you. Of course. All right. And thank you all for watching. And for those of you who aren't watching for listening after the fact, we are glad that you were able to join us and I hope you got a lot out of it. And I look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Absolute Trust Talk Live. If you enjoyed listening in, then don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you may listen by searching Absolute Trust Talk. While you're there, we would also love for you to leave us a review. And then why not share your favorite episodes with family, friends, or colleagues too? You can find all of our shows and corresponding show notes by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. You'll also find a variety of other free resources, including our eBooks, videos, blogs, presentations, and more. If you need help with your estate planning or administration, we also offer a free discovery call to help get the process started. You can find more information on booking your session by visiting absolutetrustcouncil.com slash scheduling. Don't forget to keep an eye out for our next live episode in two weeks. If you join us for the broadcast, you can submit questions during the show. But if not, don't worry. You can always get in touch with us by sending a quick message to info at absolutetrustcouncil.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you soon. This podcast is not meant to take place of legal advice from an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you do have a legal question or issue, please consult with an attorney.